Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Good morning from there, uh, where you are joining. Uh, so today we are fortunate to have Andre Fredkin with us. Just a brief introduction here. Uh, Professor Fredkin is an economist who studies uh, digitization and search and matching markets. He has written papers on topics such as the design of Airbnb search and matching algorithm, reputation systems, online job search, and 401k contribution choices by workers. So he's right now an assistant professor of marketing at the Boston University Westrom School of Business. Um, his research has been published in both economics journals like AER, Review of Economics and Statistics, as well as computer science conferences. Uh, I personally follow his research and I know it's really fascinating, especially the kind of field experiments he has uh, run with the Airbnb. Uh, apart from that, he has provided expert input about the digital economy at the President's Council on Science and Technology and the Federal Trade Commission as well. Prior to BU, he was a postdoc at Initiative on the Digital Economy at MIT, and he worked as a data scientist at Airbnb while completing a PhD in economics at Stanford University. So he's an economist who is a tech economist as Susan Ithi calls it. So uh, Andre, thank you so very much once again for accepting our invite. We are very pleased to have you with us. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Um, well, thanks for that really nice uh, introduction, Anuj. Um, and uh, thank you for coming to the seminar. Uh, I understand it's uh, a little bit late on your end, and it's a little bit early for me. So hopefully that's OK. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking about um, incentivizing reviews on Airbnb. This is joint work with uh, David Holtz, who um, was a colleague of mine at Airbnb and then ended up going the academic route and becoming an academic himself. Um, and uh, I should mention that I am not speaking on behalf of Airbnb itself in any way. So uh, don't construe my statements as representing anything related to that. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's get started. Um, so there are a variety of reputation systems that exist on the internet. Um, we kind of sometimes take it for granted that there are review systems, but they actually work in slightly different ways across the different marketplaces. So they differ in um, what you rate, like what characteristics of the product you rate. They differ in uh, how the ratings are aggregated. Are they rounded to half stars? Are they rounded to um, specific uh, decimal points? Uh, they differ in whether uh, the stars are associated with a specific piece of text or whether they're floating around just as an average. And um, how they're displayed in various parts of the website are also uh, uh, quite different. So for example, eBay, which is a reputation system that a lot of academics have studied, is a kind of a weird one, right? They have a, a positive feedback score, and that's kind of the main form of reputation that they have on that website, which is very different than the star ratings that you see on Amazon or on Airbnb or on Etsy or something like that. Uh, I, I realized I should have had a flip cart example for today, but I, but I forgot to put it in. So. Um, so I'm sure that, that, that they do something that's slightly different than some of these others. Um, so given that there are many ways to do a reputation system, uh, the other thing that is worth highlighting is that these reputation systems are well known to be imperfect. Uh, just from a theoretical point of view, uh, we know that people generally don't have an incentive to, to review and to review uh, uh, accurately. So uh, there's no, financial compensation typically uh, for review and that financial compensation is not uh, tied to the review being an accurate representation of what actually happened during the transaction. So we're already worried that kind of we're losing some information in the system. Uh, we also know that reviews can be inflated. So people will oftentimes tend to rate something higher than they really feel. 
uh, and Philippos and all discuss various reasons for why that might be happening. Uh, but that said, given these imperfections, we also know that we can increase uh, the review rates uh, by using nudges and incentives. And there are uh, several papers that have shown this, um, but even regardless of the academic literature, you, you probably noticed that almost every website sends you a reminder to leave a review. And the reason is that those reminders work. Like every company has run that A-B test and they've learned that reminders work to generate reviews. So that's why you get them. So, uh, so we kind of know that we can induce more reviews. What we don't know is whether that actually helps the market operate. I see that there's a question in chat. Uh, Anuj, are you gonna be asking on people's behalf or? No, I think uh, this is a webinar format. So what I have done is I just typed in. The oh, I see. I see. Got it. Got it. I, di I didn't. Yeah, I didn't read the, the actual question. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, second. OK, so. Um, so incentives to review are a potential solution to some of the issues with reputation system. So there is um, theory work that suggests that what we want is to increase uh, the speed of learning about quality. So as you increase the accumulation of reviews, you should learn faster about whether uh, sellers are good or bad. And just basic Econ 101 says that you can compensate people for providing a public good and that should improve the situation. But in the case of reviews, if we provide incentives, we don't know whether these reviews are actually more or less uh, informative uh, than the typical review that's submitted to the market without incentives. And that's really important. So what are we gonna do in this paper? We are going to study a large scale field experiment that ran for two years at Airbnb. Um, what this experiment did was that guests who stayed with a seller without any prior reviews were offered a coupon to submit a review. So this was targeted for sellers that didn't have uh, reviews already. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna provide the first analysis of an incentivized review policy that also measures the effect of those incentivized reviews on market outcomes. So what are we going to find? Uh, so we, the experiment is successful in creating more reviews. And these reviews tend to have lower ratings than control group reviews. Uh, however, uh, we don't find that sellers who were in the treatment group did any better in terms of revenue or quantity sold. Um, and then third, we find that the incentivized reviews are actually more inflated, conditional on a star rating, than uh, non-incentivized reviews. And that as a result, they cause worse matches in the market. And um, generally, uh, we're gonna explain these kind of, uh, nonetheless, even though we find, kind of, we, we find these effects, they're, they're quite small. And we're gonna, find, we're gonna explain the small effects um, on demand by highlighting how the market structure of Airbnb actually uh, mutes the effect of reviews in, in the market. And I'll kind of get to that at the end of the talk. Um, I'll briefly mention some related literature. So uh, a very classic paper at this point is Palade 2014. Uh, and that paper experimentally measures the effect of an intervention in which uh, Sellers are randomly hired or not in an online labor market. And uh, this paper studies the effects of that. And they find that actually just hiring someone is really beneficial to the market because what happens is that people that are never hired, um, they don't get a chance to even succeed. Uh, a key difference between that paper and our paper is that uh, we're not inducing transactions, we're inducing reviews. So everyone uh, that's in our sample was already able to have a transaction without a first review. So 
So we are studying kind of a different set of uh, users. And then uh, several papers have studied uh, policies in which the seller rather than the platform offers uh, a rebate for review. Um, the only thing I'll say about these papers and, and the key difference between our paper and theirs is that they really focus on just like what review is uh, created. Um, but they don't have an analysis of whether this review actually causes better outcomes for the market, which is a key difference for us. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, the rest of the talk will proceed as follows. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more about the setting and the theoretical framework. Uh, then I'll discuss the effects on reviews, uh, then the effects on market outcomes. Uh, then I'll explore some of the mechanisms and then I'll conclude. All right, so um, this paper is not a theory paper and we don't really have uh, a lot of theory contribution, but I did find this uh, theoretical framework from Mason Mogul and all useful. So I'll just describe it a little bit. Um, so suppose that listings have two qualities, uh, good and bad, uh, but we don't know those. Um, and the way that people learn about whether uh, something is good or bad is through reviews. Um, transactions of a buyer with one of these listings or sellers uh, have three potential outcomes. Uh, a negative review, no review, or a positive review. And based on what this outcome is, subsequent buyers are going to update their beliefs about the quality of a given seller. Now, in this simple framework, the effect uh, of incentivized reviews on quantity and welfare in the market is going to be ambiguous. Uh, why is that? Well, it depends on the frequency with which uh, negative and positive uh, reviews are generated. So are incentivized reviews generating a lot of negative reviews? In that case, we would expect the demand to actually fall, or are they generating a lot of positive reviews? Um, Secondly, the effects of reviews on demand. So let's say uh, a seller accumulates one more positive review. How much does that increase the demand? And compared to that, let's say a seller uh, accumulates a negative review. How much does that uh, affect demand? And you might think that there's some sort of asymmetry here. So maybe a negative review is really, really bad, but a positive review is kind of expected or vice versa. It really depends on how the market is structured. And then lastly, and that's just say uh, incentivized reviews. So whether incentivized reviews are more or less inflated uh, than a typical review. So if you're incentivizing reviews, uh, but there are, those reviews tend to be kind of much more noisy or much more uh, shifted towards the top, um, then that actually introduces uh, bad information into the system. So these are all things uh, that may matter for the effects of an incentivized review program. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about the setting. Um, so on Airbnb, guests and hosts are gonna uh, review each other. And the review system is a simultaneous re reveal system. So uh, I don't see what you wrote about me until I write a review about you. And you have 14 days to review. Um, the reviews are, at the, at, at the time of the experiment, we're structured uh, according to star ratings that were rounded to a half star. Furthermore, there were subcategory ratings such as accuracy, communication, cleanliness, and so on. Uh, and then there was also text of the reviews, which was associated with a picture of the guest. Um, so the, the, it looks a little differently now. Uh, but back then, this is what it looked like. All right, so the experiment. Uh, so really, it's just two emails. The treatment email that says, we noticed you didn't leave a review. Uh, reviews are helpful. And it says, review this person and get $25. And a control email that just says, you have four days left to complete a review. Um, 
The randomization occurred at the listing level. And as I previously mentioned, the listing had to have no prior reviews in order to be eligible for this. And then lastly, following the guest checkout, the guest must not have reviewed within a threshold number of days, which was typically eight or nine. So let's say I check out from a stay with a listing. I haven't left a review for nine days. I'm going to get this email. On the other hand, if I checked out and I left the review right away, I would not get this email. I would not get any uh, incentive. So it's really this policy is targeted towards um, inducing reviews. And so if you're the type of person that would have reviewed anyway within one day, you don't, the platform didn't want to give you any extra money. So that's kind of uh, why this, uh, uh, this threshold number of days was in place. Are there any questions at this point? I just I realized I haven't asked, uh, answered any. There's one actually on what do you mean by this a clarificatory question? What is inflated reviews? How do you define it? How do I define inflated reviews? Mm -hmm. um, so I was not very precise in my description um, of, of the inflated reviews, but what I mean is, let's say that you had a particular experience, like a good experience, um, to what extent am I uh, gonna rate in a way that's, that signifies something that's better than good, like excellent. So like compared to the actual quality of the experience that I had, what does the rating correspond to? So ratings would be inflated if, for example, I had a bunch of uh, terrible stays, but then I said that the listing was good. So that's that's kind of the definition of, of inflation that I have in mind. And, and kind of pe people have this understanding that reviews on Airbnb are very inflated. So uh, I think uh, over 70% of the stays are five-star ratings. So that, that probably means that there's, people aren't really fully saying how, how, how much, how good of an experience they have. Uh, there's another question. Yeah, it's one on, it will be helpful to understand distribution of reviews by number of days. Um, by number of days. So I, I don't have that for you, but I will show you the distribution of um, ratings in a couple of slides. Um, yeah. And there's one on sample size, which probably will come. I'll get to the sample size. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Having like Zoom issues, like the Zoom is not not being hidden when I share screen, which is frustrating. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's talk about the some of the summer statistics and the effects on reviews. Um, before I get to that, I want to mention this concept of a focal stay. Uh, so that's going to be the first transaction for which a listing is either in the treatment or the control group. And that's going to be contrasted to subsequent stays at that listing, which may be affected by the incentivized reviews, but which do not have incentivized reviews uh, associated with them. Okay. So here's the distribution of ratings for the focal stay. Uh, the red is the control group, the blue is the incentivized review group. So what we see here is that. Um, indeed, the number of transactions without a rating fall, and the number of transactions with each type of rating actually increase. So I'd say that this is not too surprising. So you give people some money and they review. Um, how does that affect the distribution of ratings? So this is what this figure shows. Um, and we see that uh, there are relatively more three and four star ratings and relatively fewer five-star ratings in the incentivized review group relative to the control group. And this is kind of consistent with some other previous research that says that 
when you induce reviews, they tend to be kind of more mediocre. And there's kind of an implicit model going on here that if you felt very strongly about a uh, stay, like you thought you had a very good experience, you feel compelled to rate it. But if you had a kind of mediocre experience, you don't feel compelled to rate it. But once you get this incentive, you are actually induced to do so. Okay. Um, so I realized I haven't told you the sample size yet. Uh, I thought I was gonna show it here, but I don't see it. So uh, there were about 600,000 listings um, that were in the, that were in, in the experiment. Okay. So um, for which stays are reviews induced? Um, so this is showing the difference between the treatment and the control group uh, for these. Uh, so in the treatment group, we typically have um, cheaper stays for fewer nights. Uh, they are more likely to be with multi-listing hosts. Um, so Perhaps one, what one can think of this as uh, you're more likely to review someone the longer you stayed with them. And um, if they were like not a professional host, but actually someone that's like a real person that you might have interacted with. And the incentive induces you to review for actually the types of states that you wouldn't have reviewed for otherwise, which tend to be cheaper, tend to be professionally managed and so on and so forth. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is um, the differences in the customer complaint rate. Uh, we see that we have, and that's, that's aligned with the huge standard errors, um, or in particular, that's 95% confidence interval, uh, but we don't see any detectable difference in the two. So, and that's something that we would actually really want to look for. So uh, uh, we would want to catch stays where there was a customer complaint because a customer complaint really usually means that it was a bad transaction. Uh, and we're not, there's not really a difference in the rates at which we're capturing these uh, bad experiences between the treatment and the control group. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we can look at is which stays remain not reviewed even in the treatment group. So even in the treatment group, there are stays without a review. What are those stays? Those are actually stays that have a lot of customer complaints. So what this is showing is that actually the incentive is not succeeding in generating reviews for cases where the guest had a really bad experience and had a customer complaint. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. Uh, so maybe they needed a bigger payment amount or some other sort of uh, inducement to, to leave a review because they were clearly um, upset or, or something. Um, and then the other thing is that there's the remaining stays are actually uh, more expensive and have more nights. And so uh, that might be because uh, those people who stayed for uh, more nights and for more expensive trips, they, they don't care about $25 coupons. So maybe they're just uh, it's not worth it for them. Okay. Um, so now I'll get to the effects on market outcomes, unless there are any questions. Yes, we have a question. Somehow I can see, yeah. This is a query related to the previous page. Does variation in method of feedback input change the distribution of reviews as well? For example, one click five star versus drag on a scale of one to five. Uh, like you. That's that's not that's not something I study, I guess. Um, yeah, I think it's more like your opinion kind of thing that if it's oh. like you reduce the consumer effort, will it lead to do you think more more reviews, less reviews? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I'll tell you that like the way you structure that survey about reviews actually does matter quite a bit. Like 
how you label the star ratings, the the exact user interface, it will it will matter to some extent. But I don't know about dragging or anything like that. I'm not a I guess yeah, I don't have any opinion on that. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So effects on market outcomes. So this is kind of where, what we came here for because in, in some sense, the effects on reviews, uh, you know, other people have studied that. It's kind of um, what we really care about is the market outcomes because that's why we're doing this policy in the first place. Um, and in particular, what is a platform going to care about? Uh, they might care about the, the number of transactions, the revenue from the transactions, and they'd also care about the match quality. So do people have a good experience uh, with those transactions? And the reason they care about that is if people have a good experience, they're more likely to come back to the platform and generate revenue in the future uh, and so on. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that we don't know a priori how long the effects, how long lasting the effects of a review are going to be. Are they going to be like uh, materialize in one day and then go away? Are they going to last for years? Um, and in fact, there's kind of in the literature, there are kind of different perspectives on this. Uh, so there's some papers that suggest that like one negative review can destroy your reputation forever and as a seller. Uh, but then there are other uh, papers that kind of suggest that only the topmost review matters. So as long as you get kind of uh, other reviews, they're going to wash away the any bad reviews that you get. So as a result of this, we're going to consider a variety of time horizons. Uh, and we're going to use just very simple econometric specifications. So uh, we're going to have an outcome uh, for listing L um, at some time horizon. And that's going to be a function of whether that listing was in the treatment group or in the control group. The other thing to note is that um, not all uh, treated listings were reviewed. Uh, so even with the incentive, not everyone got a review. So the other thing that we do is an instrumental variable specification, uh, which is very similar, except the uh, controlled variable is going to be whether the listing was reviewed and our instrument was going to be the experimental assignment. So, um, so that's kind of uh, the interpretations of the first one is it's the intent to treat effect and the interpretation of the second one is the prior average causal effect or the local average treatment effect of the, of the review. Okay, so what do we find? Um, so here on the x-axis, are the time horizons and days. So seven days, 14 days, 30 days, et cetera. And we're tracking four different outcomes. So uh, views, so how many views did the listing receive? How many transactions? How many nights? And the booking value. Um, and what we see is that the views and transactions um, do increase a bit. They're statistically significant between 30 and 120 days. Um, on the other hand, uh, the number of nights booked and the booking value are much closer to zero and they're not statistically significant. So, uh, so takeaway from this is that there, there isn't really much effect on what the platform ultimately cares about, which is quantity sold and the booking value, uh, from, from this, uh, incentivized reviews and I'll, kind of get back to why that might be happening in a little bit. Um, and then, uh, so this is the intent to treat effect. The complier average causal effect is the same, uh, the same exact graph in some sense, because all we're doing is we're scaling the outcome uh, by the, the review rate. Um, so, but this allows you to at least get a, get a sense of the magnitude of the effect of the review. Uh, so, for views, the effect of the review is a little bit less than 10%. Um, uh, but we have an effect that's essentially zero uh, for nights, although there is some uh, uncertainty about the actual effect size. OK. Um, so uh, we also want to investigate whether the trips, the types of trips that were taken were different 
uh, for listings that were affected by the treatment versus those that were not. And we see that uh, treated uh, listings got trans subsequent transactions that were for fewer nights. So that kind of explains why transactions go up, but nights don't go up because the transactions that do occur occur for fewer nights. Uh, but we don't detect any effects on um, the trip revenue, the price per night, or the lead time. So how many days we get in the booking and the stay. Okay, so next I want to talk about measuring transaction quality or match quality. Uh, so generally, this is very hard to measure. In fact, why do we have a review system in the first place? It is to measure this because otherwise we don't have other, other ways to do it. Um, we use three measures. One is the customer complaint rate. Uh, second is subsequent ratings. So ratings not in the experiment, but ratings that occur after the experiment. And um, the guest subsequent nights on the platform. So this is kind of a measure of the extent to which guests come back to Airbnb after transacting either with a treated or with a control listing. So what do we find? Uh, we're looking at this second line. Uh, we don't find any effect on the complaint rates. Uh, we do find that the review rate is higher for subsequent transactions at treated listings. And those reviews tend to have lower star ratings. So this is at least some suggestive evidence that the transaction quality is falling. And then in columns four and five, we look at the guest nights after, um, after staying with a treated or control listing. And we see that that falls as well. Uh, so that's another indicator that actually the match quality is falling due to the incentivized review. So that's interesting. And so uh, why might the match quality fall? They might fall if the incentivized reviews are actually inflated and they're actually more biased than the reviews that are coming in organically. And to investigate that, we're gonna um, consider um, whether conditional on experience quality, one group has higher ratings or the other. The way we do that is we're gonna regress uh, the subsequent rating. So let's say in the treatment, uh, I rated five stars. What is the rating that that listing gets for the next, next transaction that comes in, right? So if the ratings are accurate, then um, they should be quite correlated with each other. If they're not accurate, they should be less correlated with each other. So, okay. So now coming back to this regression specification I'm showing, um, we see that a five star rating in the treatment is less predictive of a future uh, high rating than a five star rating in the control group. And so that's suggesting that actually uh, the, tr the incentivized reviews are less accurate than the organic reviews uh, in terms of predicting quality. And the different columns here, just because we're limited on time, I'm not gonna get into them, but there are different subsamples that you might be interested in, but the result is, is robust across those. Uh, how am I doing on time? All right, so uh, now I want to explore the mechanisms a little bit. Uh, so, so recall that we find very small effects on demand and on revenues for the platform. So uh, why might we have such small effects? Um, so first, the market structure. So how Airbnb works and the relative supply and demand balance is gonna allow listings to get reviews from other transactions as well. Uh, so that's kind of one reason. Uh, second reason is that the star ratings are not gonna be shown until a listing gets three reviews. And so even if you got uh, a low star rating due to the incentivized review, that's not gonna be seen by the uh, by the guests until their listing has three reviews. Um, and then lastly, we thought about, well, maybe there's actually, what's going on is there's a lot of heterogeneity. 
some listings are helped, some listings are hurt, and they average it out to zero. And we kind of argue that uh, we, we do some stuff to argue that that's not what's going on. Um, so let me uh, discuss these a little, little bit more detail. So here I'm showing you um, a distribution of days to first review, um, doing the control group and incentivized review group. So uh, we see that in the incentivized review group, uh, it is getting, uh, there are, it is lower uh, the, the days to first review than in the control group. But the difference is actually uh, just six days. So the difference between two, those two vertical lines is just six days. So even the control listings that didn't have incentivized reviews, they're eventually getting reviewed anyway. And the reason that they're getting reviewed is they have other transactions and those transactions potentially result in a review as well. Um, now you might say, well, maybe this is something that's unique to Airbnb. The reviews um, are uh, coming in so quickly from other transactions. Um, we also show that something very similar is going on on a large home improvement services platform that I've studied in some other work of mine. So it's not unique to Airbnb that sellers are able to accumulate reviews from many transactions relatively quickly. Um, we also look for heterogeneity in the effects. So maybe kind of there's a lot of heterogeneity that washes out. And in particular, uh, we looked at um, heterogeneity by uh, the predicted future uh, stays, nights, and booking value of, of listings. And we were not able to detect any statistically significant heterogeneity and the effects and the coefficients on those heterogeneity coefficients seem to be close to zero. So it doesn't seem like heterogeneity is driving uh, this, this average small effect. Okay, so uh, let me then conclude. Uh, so we investigate the effects of large scale incentives to review on Airbnb. We find no effect on revenue or quantity and negative effects on match quality. Um, uh, we show how market structure might be causing these small effects on revenue and quantity. And we also show that uh, review inflation might be causing this negative effect on match quality. And um, kind of as a final point, I just wanna mention that when we're studying reputation systems, we should really be focusing on creating better matches. And uh, it is critical to measure this outcome. And I think a lot of the work that we've seen about online reviews doesn't, which is really, I think, problematic. I think the literature has been looking at the wrong thing for a very long time. Um, so, so I'll end with that. Uh, thanks. Awesome. Uh, I can see one question here, which says that uh, since the properties you are considering for the experiment are all who have not received reviews, is there something done to check if they are systematically different from the normal properties? Yeah, so they are systematically different. And the main reason which they're different is just that they're new. They tend to be new listings. Um, but they're also going to be uh, uh, different in other ways from the typical uh, listing in that they're going to be typically lower quality. Um, because those high quality listings uh, generally get reviewed right away. So like, let's say I stayed at a, at a listing and I had a very good experience, then I'm going to review it the next day. And remember to be in this experiment, you have to um, not have been reviewed within seven or eight, sorry, within eight or nine days. Um, so, but I, I'll just say that like, or just a meta comment. Um, so these incentives were offered to a selected sample of listings. But the reason that they were is that the platform thought that these were the ones that most could benefit from additional reviews. Um, if you did incentivize reviews for a different sample of listings, for example, a random sample, um, you might get different effects. Although my hunch is that there wouldn't be much of an effect at all. And the reason is that if 
a lot of listings already have like reviews. So one more review for a listing that already has 15 reviews, but it seems unlikely that that would have any effect. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, the control condition also seems to incentivize reviewing by inducing time pressure. Could this have affected the results in any way? Sorry. The control. The, um, I would not say that it increases. I guess. The control condition is what was being done in the already for every single transaction. So it was so it was like the exact thing you want in your control condition would be to have um, a reminder email. So we were not studying the effects of reminder emails. We were studying the effects of incentives compared to just a reminder email. So I I don't think it. I mean, of course, it affects the result because. Uh, if we didn't have a reminder email, then the review rates would even be lower. But I think that that's the right thing to have in the control group. Right. Right. Uh, just a quick follow-up question here. Uh, do you think the kind of incentive that you provide can have an impact on the balance of the reviews or the volume of reviews? I mean, certain incentives might make you you know, write reviews in a way versus uh, certain other incentives. Yeah, so, so it's interesting. It's not something that was explored in this experiment, okay. uh, but but I think one thing that's that seems important to try is that this was a coupon, right? right. So the, the only way you can use a coupon is by using Airbnb again. Yeah. And if People that truly had a terrible experience with Airbnb, they're never going to use it again. So they don't care about a coupon. So nice. you're already kind of, you're kind of providing, it's cheaper for the platform clearly to offer coupons because a lot of people don't redeem them. Um, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it might not be helping with, with those people who don't want to use Airbnb again. So that's kind of one way in which the incentives can be structured differently. You can also think about the, the amount of the incentive, and you can also think about maybe some conditionality of the incentive. So maybe uh, the incentive might be offered only if your review is very helpful or something like that. And I don't know how we measure helpfulness, but you can imagine that we could think of doing that. Right, right. Just one quick question before we take the others here. Uh, so right now, a lot of work is being done on fair, fair marketplaces and fair recommendations. And uh, so here, if we say that, you know what, if you incentivize people to post reviews, the balance can go in one direction, okay? So ultimately, if you have to take a decision, what, what should a product manager or, or someone looking at the platform should do? Should they also incentivize equal, equal reviews or equal incentive structure for properties who already have reviews so that it counterbalances the impact that you get for those properties which didn't have reviews or? Uh... It's interesting. So, I, I guess, I guess the purpose of this experiment was to really help the new sellers. Yeah. It, just didn't, it just didn't do it. So like, um, I guess, I guess the thought was this was this experiment would be fair. It would actually make the marketplace more e equal, but it didn't have that effect. Um, but I think the results of the experiment just show that you shouldn't be doing this type of incentive, right? Like it had no effect on revenue and it made match quality worse. So that that's not good, uh, and it costs money to the platform. So. Uh, so I don't think the platform should be doing the same thing for other sellers. It should just not do this, or it should try to think about other ways to do incentives that are actually useful. So if I was running the team that was responsible for this, I would, I guess you'd have two choices. One is like, maybe just forget about incentives. This is not a good pathway. And 
and you do that, or you keep on iterating with different types of incentives and different for different types of sellers to try to get a policy that actually helps the market. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. There's one question on the. I'm not sure if you are you are you also tracking the reviewer profiles so more on uh, the intrinsic nature of the review writer and. If yes, are you looking at any, do you see any heterogeneity there or? Uh, uh, like if I had written reviews in the past? Something like that. I mean, that's the question here, that heterogeneity on the basis of profile of the uh, reviewers. So we have looked at that in, in some previous work, but not, not for this one. Um, mm. I guess, I would think that we we might be underpowered, just because a lot of reviewers don't have don't have a lot of review. There are people that don't have a lot of reviews uh, historically to learn from about their reviewer profiles. So. Right, right. There's there is one here. Doesn't the number of transactions going up matters to the platform, even though the number of nights booked and the value are unaffected, there is an increase in the number of people buying that listing. In some sense, this means that more people are willing to try out a new listing because of incentivized review. So in a sense, they are saying uh, your paper still makes a great contribution. Um, I, I, I guess I would disagree with that. I, I think it's a little bit mechanical what's going on here. So um, I'm so this list, the treated listing gets booked, but gets booked for fewer nights. And so there are other nights that remain to be booked that other people book. So then so so I think it's more like how do you pack transactions into a given set of nights? And it's not really expanding the demand very much. So, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, but, but it just, yeah. it doesn't seem that Im important that there are more transactions when all, what you really care about is nights sold and, yeah. and, and revenue. Right, right, right. This we already answered. So variety of incentives you haven't experimented with, but this is just one incentive structure. There's one question here, in addition to listings with no prior reviews, Another group of listings might be those who haven't received any review in last six months or one year as an additional. I see. Addition. Yeah, I, but let's think about why that might happen, right? Like mm. the reason that, that might happen is that they didn't transact because we know that the review rate on Airbnb is around 70%. So, um, I, he I hear you that we might want to learn more about those that haven't tra transacted in a while, uh, but also there are going to be very few of them. So if you've, if you've been transacting a lot in the past six months, then you definitely have reviews. So it would have to be really like people that who pause their listing yeah. and, then, and then came back to the platform. Yeah. Right, right. And there is one more question. If experiment is expanded to listings with prior reviews, it seems average ratings won't change much as there is a re relatively more of mediocre ratings than extreme ratings. I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it that way. I would say that if it was expanded to listing with, with prior reviews, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have as much of an effect, but that's because it, the, the incentivized reviews being averaged with all the other reviews. Right. Even if it is lower, even if the rating is lower, it's just being averaged with so many more reviews that it, it's unlikely to have much of an effect. Right. right. I think we are out of questions here. Maybe any last questions if you guys have, you can just type in. Yeah, Nikita has a question. Why don't you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, hello. hello, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I was just wondering if you can also comment a bit about how did you decide uh, which listings will go to the control and which will go to the treatment? Uh, I mean, I want to understand, like, 
for example, if you are controlling a listing that is in treatment and one that is in control, what are the factors uh, that uh, that determine that okay these two listings are comparable, right? Is it the kind of characteristics of the listing itself? Let's say the number of bedrooms or the location. I just wanted, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So sorry, like this is just the magic of randomization. Okay. So we have the a big set of listings, uh, and we flip a coin for each one of them. And some of them are going to be in the treatment group, and some of them are going to be in the control group. And we know that, um, on average, those differences between the treatment really? and the control group are going to are going to cancel out. So that's that's kind of why we do randomization first place. So, um, in terms of kind of using other randomization methods, such as those based on like stratification, uh, mm -hmm. like we can imagine, oh, we can rent, we, we find everyone in, you know, in Delhi and mm -hmm. every list in Delhi and then we randomize within Delhi doing the treatment and the control group. We might do that if we have a very um, small sample size and we really need additional statistical power, but it makes kind of less sense to do that when we have hundreds of thousands of listings, right? Right, great, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we don't have any more questions. Okay, on, so I think on that note, thank you so very much, Andre, once again. Uh, yeah, Nikita, uh, is there any more No, questions? no, by mistake, just, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. So thank you so very much once again uh, for taking our time uh, and sorry to wake you up early. Uh, that's not the time you usually wake up, but it was a really great talk and I can see a lot of interest. So uh, among the audience, thank you so very much once. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for inviting me and for all the questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.